from Relay FM. This is Upgrade, episode 501. Today's show is brought to you by Squarespace and Uni Pizza Ovens. It is February 26, 2024. My name is Mike Hurley. I'm joined by Jason Snow. Hello, Jason. Happy February 26th, Mike. To all who celebrate. To all who celebrate, yes. Whoever they are, wherever they are. I have a Snow Talk question for you. It comes from Seb. Seb would like to know... How much has the video version of Upgrade complicated the recording process when you are away from home? Hmm. Hmm. Well, for me, so I was away from home last week. It only complicated it because I use, actually, I use for both travel and for when I'm here at home, I use uh, camo with my uh, iPhone Mm -hmm. as my camera. I don't use continuity camera because... I found that continuity camera is a little flakier than camo and the direct wired connection. I have more control over over it. So I'm using camo instead of just continuity camera. So the real complication is just that I have to bring something to put the camera on to get the proper angle. And I actually have got now a little setup where I've got a... um, I bought a I bought a little tripod, a little cheap tripod on Amazon that has a like flip out phone holder attachment, like a glyph, except it's built mm. into it, and it's got a little tilt head and stuff. And then it, I, I but I didn't like the legs, but it's actually you know standard uh, tripod connector. Uh, and my Insta three sixty tri- little selfie stick tripod thing with the 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 the, the cheap one on Amazon didn't have a, an adjustable like you can't lift it up and push it down. It's only one height even though it's got the tilt head and stuff. The Insta360 combination selfie stick tripod thing, that's its whole thing is it's super adjustable. So I actually am using the base from the, I'm using the Insta360 thing with the head of the other cheap tripod thing. And it folds up real nice. It works with my phone. It fits on the desk at my mom's house where I was doing the show last week. It's great. So that is my only... I'd say my only real complication because I got I got USB cords and I got my phone with me, so um, there's a little bit of like lighting issues. There, I'm more concerned about them for when I do Mac Break Weekly because that is a video show primarily, or at least intent, produced that way, and so I'm a little more concerned about that. Mm. But you know, even then, I have a I have a, actually I have a green screen at my mom's house, and the lighting is very good because there's a wall out the window that. It, in the morning bounces the light off of the the stucco wall and into my face it's actually shamed me about how bad my lighting is at my studio because the lighting is better at my mom's house it's true it is better there so um so other than a little bit of brain power to like think about it and having invested in that tripod which i also use like when i'm in the studio b back of my house i use the same setup so, you know, not a lot, but a little. Big, I mean, more than not worrying about it at all. How about you? I like the idea of the green screen at your mom's because you could just green screen your own office. Look at everybody, look at done. last week's Smack Break Weekly, and it looks like I'm in my office. And oh, I am not. really? Oh, yeah. Oh, I need to go check that out. I'm going to go look at yeah. that right now. Yeah, I need, to, I need to build a video loop. That's my next to do, is to build a video loop of my office. Why would you need because that, though? Because I've got, so I've got the, the um, for Mac break, I turn on the lava lamp in my background uh. and it has little bubbles moving and there's just a bubble that's suspended forever. And that, that's the, that's the tell. And I actually kind of uh, love the idea really that good, it's, Jason. right? This looks really good because you blurred it too, right? So like, Oh yeah, yeah. It's got, I put the bouquet in there just to make it a little less obvious that it was, uh, yeah, exactly. Because the funny thing is, uh, Alex Lindsay I assume is sitting in his actual office and has a really yeah. good camera or whatever, and so he has a bit of a blur. So <laughs> yes. you doing it too? <laughs> that's very funny to me. You just yep. like well to play at that game. Yeah, I can, yes, that's right. I can do that too. <laughs> anyway, I did get a I did get a message last week from somebody who said, "Wow, do you have a new setup? You looked great on Mac Break Weekly." And I thought, "Oh boy, I, I like it's a worse. It sounded great. I'm like it's a worse microphone." It's not any different I will camera. Just say, like, we didn't it's the lighting it on last week's episode, but like you were using a different mic. I hate that mic for you. Like, yeah, and I've said it to you before. It's just because yeah. you, I am used to I, a I hate... very specific sound of yeah. Jason. I know. And I don't like it. I, I don't no. even like the so, um the USB C version of that microphone that you have for you. Uh, yeah, no, that that's what that is. So so I use I I to use the this podcasting nerdery, but like I there's a a, a 
uh, commonly promoted by us like best cheap starter podcast mic, which is the Audio Technica mic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I traveled with that because I made two stops. I went to LA and I went to my mom's house. I was gone for six days and I felt I needed a little more space in my suitcase. I think in hindsight, I should have just taken the, the MV7, which is the where I what I have in the in the back of the house, which is very similar to the SM7B I have out here. And uh, I chose not to. And then I had the moment where I thought, you know, I could just leave the, the Audio Technica mic at my mom's house with the green screen and the mic stand and all mm-hmm. these other things and just kind of leave it there so I don't need to travel with it. And I had, the, had that thought of like, hmm, no, I don't want this to be the mic that I use when I'm here. <laughs> so I, in future, I'm going to travel with the, the Shure mic, which is a better sound. It's more, it is. It's more like this one. Um, but yeah, to, to actually answer, because I, I got sidetracked by your incredible uh, audio, video Background. trickery. Um, Nobody, don't tell anybody it's secret. I would You'll say never know now. Never know. It has been well documented, especially in Upgrade Plus. I am have been putting a lot less effort <laughs> into the video than Jason yes. has. Mainly because True. really you are doing a podcast that I think in Mac Break Weekly it, it kind of I don't know if incongruously is the word I'm looking for, but like Twitch shows go video the video first, even though they're TV shows that have an audio podcast version, the, but they're the TV shows. They're is built as TV shows. Leo's history. Audio. Uh, yeah, it's TV. So yeah. you, you know you you kind of have to put the effort in there where we're very much just playing around with stuff and the clips. Right. Really, I think that you know it, it's fine. Uh, by the way, I will implore people to check out either our Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube. I put links in the show notes. If you've not if you have any of these platforms, if you not follow us on those, you should. The video the short clips especially, they're just really good fun. Like you may think to yourself, but I've already heard them say that. It's really fun to watch back our reactions to the things that we say sometimes and mm-hmm. our editor chip puts in some fun little details. Sometimes there's also stuff that we never actually spoke about in the show, but they we did record it. Uh, but it's more interesting as a clip than it is as being in the show. Yeah. So they're there for you. But I, I have a whole plan that I delayed because of Vision Pro expenses to make my setup better for video. So like I have a whole plan. I'm very excited about it, actually. It's going to look better. And once I've actually done that, my video when I travel will be able to be better. Because previously, I've just been using... When I was traveling, I just used my laptop my, uh, camera, which is terrible. I hate it. Um but I'm actually planning on buying a refurbished iPhone for my camera in the studio. And then I'll just take that with me and have that as like my camera for if we record when I'm traveling. So it it, it is uh, just in general, though, the video has complicated things, but yes. not to a level that we haven't got used to. And also there is kind of like we're still audio first. Like if something goes wrong yeah. with a video, it is kind of just like, oh, well. That's what happened. Yeah, it, you know, I'd say there's a there's a almost an effort cut off. Like when I went to my daughter's graduation from college, mm-hmm. I was I recorded an episode of Upgrade in an Airbnb, mm-hmm. and you know what? It was on the MacBook Air webcam. Yeah, in bad lighting, and it looked <clears throat> it looked terrible. It looked terrible, but it crossed it crossed the line of I I just. I couldn't do it. Now I've got a better setup. Like we're building, I think what what I would say is we're building our setups to be, um, to get us across the line of yes. this is this is appropriate. But it has required me to buy like different tripods and try different mm-hmm. setups up. Um, we'll get there about it. So so not nothing, Seb. Not nothing. But um, it's fine. Like we're also not overdoing it because we are a podcast first and a, yep. and and the video is entirely secondary. That said, I you know, I I hope that for our our podcast listeners or people who don't listen a lot to podcasts because they're sort of YouTube first people. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're doing this is the short version is we we don't intend to become a YouTube show or anything, but I do think that there are people out there who don't get podcasts. They don't understand it or they don't it doesn't work in their life and they love YouTube and they have YouTube stuff on all the time. And I would like I would like us to make our show available there. And if we can make it available with our faces instead of just like a logo on a screen, I think that would be better. So you know we'll what see. We I should do, which I don't think we have done, but we should do, is actually tell YouTube that our channel is a podcast. Oh, we maybe we could do that. Can we? T- can we do that? I don't can know how you do it. How do we break? 
but how do we is, break that to them? It's doable. Like it, there is okay. a thing that you can do. I mean, this is like a weird thing that Cortex is it, but we didn't do it. YouTube did it yeah, for oh, us. Yeah, interesting. But interesting. I know that there is a way now to kind of be like, hey, this is a podcast. And what that allows is people can watch the video, but then they can also tap a button and it turns off the video if they just want to listen mm. to us as a podcast. So, so. another funny little data point. Um, a podcast that I mentioned during the upgrade is The Rest is History, a podcast I really like with the two British historians. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I found their YouTube channel while I was traveling. Oh. And I watched one of their episodes as a video on YouTube because yeah. it turns out they, they have recently started doing exactly what we're doing, right down to the fact that one of them's facing left and one of them's facing right and they're uh-huh. recording it separately from their... It's a, it's hilarious. Oh, yeah, it's like exact exactly what we're doing. And I, I kind of nodded along and I was like, okay, this is great. Like if I want to watch them in a YouTube context, I can. But if I just want to listen to their audio episodes, which is true most of the time, I can do that too. And then they also do little clips, which I, I enjoy. And the Flophouse does that. They don't post full episodes, but they post the clips. And I mm-hmm. I like watching clips of things I've already heard because I get to see their faces and it's the yep. funniest of the jokes from that episode. And so that's I, I don't mind listening to the funny jokes again. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's anyway. This is a lot. I wonder if is this listener Seb who I actually met last weekend in LA? Maybe it is. Anyway, Maybe. hi, listener Seb. Let's do some uh, Vision Pro follow up. So we had an anonymous right. person write in, and they said, "I work in Apple retail. From mid January, we started receiving training for the Vision Pro uh, on delivering the perfect script for the demo yeah. of the Apple Vision Pro. There was no training on what light seal numbers mean." Vision Pros are meant to be picked up in store, so everyone, in theory, gets the right light seal on band size before they come into us. But we have no guidance on what their sizes and numbers actually mean. We just follow a questionnaire to get a new size if requested, which can change every time on how subjectively the person answers said questions. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, you can literally game it. Yeah. Because you can do that online, too, when you're doing a return. Because yep. I got the 14 or whatever, and I'm sending it back because it's just not. Or I have sent it back now because it didn't fit at all. It really put all the pressure on my cheekbones. Um, and I'm not convinced I have the right size. I think the 21 is maybe the right size for me. Mm-hmm. But um, I've sort of tried this and failed, and I don't know what I'm I'm going to do. But this follows up what we were saying before, which is lots of focus on the yep. demo and getting every word right. And then kind of being at sea when it comes to the sizing stuff, which I think they should do a much better job of. Yep. Vision Pro units are cracking. <gasps> crack gate. Crack gate. How is a Vision Pro like a G4 cube? Crack gate. Cracks. Crack gate. So uh, there's been a bunch of articles written about this. Uh, it's, I believe, started with um, a selection of users on the Vision Pro subreddit posting that they have cracks along the center of the front screens of their Vision Pro. So right in, basically right in the middle. Um, No one obviously knows at this point why this is happening. It appears to be, you would assume, some kind of manufacturing issue. Uh, One of the things to me that really kind of lent credence to this, because, you know, you never really know what's going on or with this kind of stuff, is it actually happened to Engadget's review unit as well. The same crack. Mm. Um, so it's essentially on the middle of the front glass is where it's happening. There's a bunch of images uh, in the Verge article and the Engadget article that I put in the show notes. Um, but yeah, it's definitely making me, every time I pick up my Vision Pro in the morning, just taking a look, just like, oh, they got a crack. No, that's great. There just give go. it a look and, and check it out. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's 1.0 hardware. It's incredibly yep. complicated. I'm actually not surprised. And I would imagine, I mean, either Apple will say, look, it doesn't affect your you know, we know that it it might happen and it doesn't affect it, or they'll say we will replace it. Yeah, you know, send send it to us and we'll replace it or whatever. So, um, but, but it it's does seem like so far, like with the people that have had it happen, like it isn't affecting anything. But it, right, it's there. It it seems to be at the moment mostly a cosmetic issue, which I think right. is also good because if, if something like that happens and it disrupts the cameras or whatever, nobody be, wants uh, to see you in this thing anyway. What not is great. It? matter what it looks like um what's new with your vision pro experience oh what's new with the vision pro yeah um so i mentioned i traveled last week i mentioned Mm -hmm. i used it on the plane Mm -hmm. had the weird errors uh used it a little bit in phoenix have used it here too um big story for me i think is that i went on the developer beta oh god (laughs) jason why (laughs) why'd you do 
You know, because it's my job, I figure like, okay, let's try uh, it. And I can report I think the personas are better. Yeah. I did a I did a very quick persona capture in Phoenix when I was not at my best, and I still think it is a much better representation of me okay. than the one I was using before. Okay. So I think the personas are better. However, I'm just gonna say, uh, don't don't put the beta on people. Um, the eye tracking and other input stuff is just a total mess. I can't. Mm. I was writing a lot. I, I think one of the things that I found in the Vision Pro that I like is that it it is another place for me to write. I can sit in you know on the couch or whatever and i can kind of isolate and just get a screen in front of me with like runestone on it and i can write articles and and have things to the side but like mostly i'm focused on the thing i like that it's like like writing on the ipad i've got a little bluetooth keyboard it's great but um i kind of can't do it on the developer beta because eye tracking is all over the place input is all over the place i get lots of inaccurate clicks Th- clicks when I'm not moving my fingers together. Uh, my eye tracking is not looking at the right place. Mm. Even if I rerun eye tracking, it just doesn't seem right. It is uh, kind of broken. So mm. I'm I'm here I'm he- I'm here to warn you not to do it because no improved persona is worth this. So and I, um, I'm assuming there's kind of no it. way to go back, right? Well, um, I could I could put it in reset mode since okay. I have the developer strap. I could ah, actually do that, yes, you need the dev uh, but I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna grin and bear it, mm. and and that's uh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, I actually similarly, um, I've had some flakiness of eye tracking, and I'm I'm on the the shipping version. Like today, I had to redo my eye tracking again to get it to work. It just, I would look at something and it would select it for a second and flick away. And so, like, I couldn't move any windows. <laughs> uh, I have also noticed sometimes the system knows where you're looking, even though it's not highlighting that, if that makes sense. So, like, sometimes I've found yes. that, like, I can look at something and it's not highlighting, but if I pinch, it will do what I want. And so I think there yes. was a combo of both things happening. Um, but once I redid my eye tracking, it, it was... It, it was perfect. Like it worked perfectly okay. again, but you know, I, I don't know why that's happening. Right. Like, which is just interesting. It's like, what's changed, but right. This is the bleeding edgeness of this computer. It's like something it is perceiving something differently. Yeah. It could, I, it no could literally it be, yeah, it could be something on your face. It could yep. be that your, you, your, your hair has grown or been cut and the fit is a little different. Yep. And so the angle is a little different, right? Yep. Like there's so, so many things it could be. Yep. So I kind of I'm giving the I'm giving the machine grace, right? In mm-hmm. in doing these things and not being like, Oh, this is so annoying, but it is just a thing that I'm spotting. Um I have kind of set on something for me for where I think this device really works best. So um I, I leave my uh, Vision Pro at my studio. I don't take it home because it's just too much weight mm. to just keep moving backwards and forwards. Uh-huh. Uh so I leave it there. And so I'm mostly using it when I'm here, which actually works best for me anyway of like a way that I would want to use it. Um, Like when I'm at home, I'm either going to be wanting to spend time with my wife or be playing video games. And the Vision Mm. Pro is not the right device for me for either of those things. And so it would be mostly wasted at home. And so what I've been doing mostly is like I'm trying to do my like intense work in the mornings with the Vision Pro on and then also just using it sporadically through the day. And where I've found the device to be the most enjoyable and the way that I kind of think of it is the Vision Pro is like the perfect noodling computer, which for what I mean by that is <laughs> <laughs> so like there is a point in the day where I say today I've done my work in the morning of preparing upgrade, which is like the biggest job I do on a Monday. And, and then I have one meeting. Then I have the stretch of like a stretch of like 90 minutes before I have another meeting. And so during that time, typically, I'm just kind of noodling around. I'm doing this little task here, reading these advanced, I'm reading these like uh, messages here in Slack, I'm looking at this uh, email here or whatever. And I kind of consider this as like noodling around. And iPads are really good for this, I find. Yep. Um, you're just like poking around, you're going from this to this. Hey, what's going on over here? Like, the Vision Pro is perfect for this because 
you can do all of the noodling with all of the apps open, right? And that's what I like about it. Like I can just set a yeah. bunch of apps and I'm like, what's going on over here? Oh, look, can we go check on these tabs? Oh, like in today, I was like looking at some home furnishing stuff and I was like, oh, just like click, click, clicking around this website, which is really nice with the eye tracking. Like, oh, I like that cushion. This looks nice. That looks nice. Let me add that to a note, send it to my wife. Like that kind of work, the Vision Pro is the best computer I own at it. Like, it's better than an iPad because it's many iPads, right? It's like six iPads at once. It's Um, many iPads. And so I find for, for like, the intense work stuff, it's definitely getting the job done. But still, I'm mostly just using the Mac inside of it. And at that point, it's not that much better. It's better in some ways, worse in others. I think that this could be improved by there being a native Google Docs application. Like I think that, that will help if and when that ever happens because using Google Docs in Safari while it works is not ideal. Maybe it yeah. will be better, but I'll probably still prefer my Mac for it. Um, so I, I find it to be to be good at the intense stuff, but excellent at the kind of noodling around stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I have the same sort of feelings that you end up kind of like flipping around to a bunch of different stuff and... Um, part of that is what it's good at right now and what apps are available. Um, I did watch a movie in it for The Incomparable. I watched mm. most of a movie um, just that was my homework in it because it was a bigger screen. So I was, yeah. you know, I was literally sitting in my living room, not four feet from my 4K TV, and I was watching it on the Vision Pro instead because Lauren was gone and I was, uh, I, why not? So I did. And uh, it was nice because it was a huge screen and it was fun. There was also an app that I wanted to uh, point people to, which is Television from Sandwich. Uh, This is just, this is the exact kind of thing that I want Mm -hmm. to exist on the Vision Pro because it's just like fun and joyful. It is an app that currently you can watch media you've downloaded or media from your iCloud but they seem to be working on the ability to watch streaming services within this app mm-hmm. as well where you essentially can select a television from history from the beginnings of televisions to now yes. my, one of my yeah. favorite ones it, is a wall of televisions that you can watch media on right and you essentially watch it like a screen it's a 3d model of televisions from history and they exist in space they're they're not like i when i opened this app i thought oh okay this is the kind of vision pro app there aren't very many of right now Mm -hmm. and that i thought would be the ones that would truly take it i and i understand why they aren't because it is not something you can do by converting an ipad app right or or easily it's much harder and so it's a 3d object you know in 3d space Mm -hmm. that then plays a video right now yeah limited to on the screen mapped onto the screen of the tv or tvs so like i was able to get an old tv with rabbit ears and place it on my coffee table and play an old star trek episode on it i i played an old star trek episode then i played a the star wars holiday special (laughs) then i played an old doctor who episode because i wanted that vibe of old four by three tv set with rabbit ears and it was just kind of delightful but i also like the idea i was talking to dan Sturm, who worked on this product our friend of the show who uh who works at Sandwich. And Dan, uh, you know, what I said to Dan was, this is this is the kind of app I was hoping for. And he said, you know, it's just so easy to leave it somewhere, like off to the side. And the way it works is like the audio comes out of it spatially. Yep. It's literally like you're setting a TV set somewhere in your space. Yep. And then the TV set's there and, 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 and you can play it. And what they've said is like the use case here is, you kind of want to, if you want like some background stuff, which for some people is super distracting and for other people it's comfortable. So this is the idea is like you want something playing in the background off to the side that you can look at and look back and it's in this little TV and like, is it novel? Yes, it is a novelty app for sure. But at the same time I look at it and I think, yeah, that's that's kind of what I want for something like broadcasts or other audio apps where I kind of want to put essentially like a radio or an object that is just kind of emitting and put it in the corner, put it on a wall and have it be not, it doesn't need to be like a, 
a, a Vision Pro OS window that's like an iPad app for that part of it. I just kind of want it to be, especially if you think about the future of Vision OS and potentially having objects that permanently live in a space that, you know, that we all kind of expect that they will do, where if I hang this thing in my house right in this place, it'll, I can say, keep it here geographically. I just This is where I want this thing. Um, that it opens up a lot of possibilities. So it's just it's just a, a fun app. I really loved having. I watched uh, most of a Star Trek episode on it. It was great. Yeah, I really look forward to when it can. They they put YouTube in there, which they're working on. Because you could, right. you know, I could have imagine having one of those like low fi beat to chill two things and just putting it in the corner, looking over and seeing right. the image. But there's music in the space. Like this is the kind of stuff that also I hoped would exist. Um, just these fun little toys, but they're, they're useful, right? But they're joyful in a way. Mm -hmm. And I think there will be more. I think that it requires two things for a lot of developers, which is like time and effort. Well, three things, time, effort, and a, a genuine love for the platform because the audience is small right now. And there's, this yeah. requires a lot of work, right? It also makes me wonder if Vision OS should have something, and I know they've got a lot on their on their plate for vision os but if they should have something that's sort of like what picture in picture is on ios and ipad os and mac os which is the ability for apps to say you know knock out place you know place this video out and then the ability for other apps to say i'm a player for that right because imagine if you could do that then sandwich you know sandwiches television could could be a player for the picture in picture and then there wouldn't need to be compatibility things built into the app you could build a player that is like television and then all the video apps would just you know you could just send it out to that other app i, I wonder if you could do that because it's it seems very similar to the picture in picture api i would love it um something like that but failing that yeah i hope i hope sandwich builds in some stuff for this I, i'd love again it's like the, whether it's them working with various services or whether it's third-party apps maybe working with sandwich yeah. which would also be cool like if you're the developer of plex and you want to come to the vision pro do you talk to sandwich and say can we license television for our plex player or work with you or something right yeah because that I would love be the name by the more way more fun it's, it's so silly right like it's, yes because the, a lot of the because they, they're so good their marketing is just obviously I know. they're so they're good so they're just good. so good and it, you know the idea of like we invented television like is the you know and like and they're very yeah. strong imagine like, I love it an so much. object in your space that's playing video on it <laughs> like, we call it in the, television I think if I remember rightly in the video there's a television in the room yeah that they're doing the promo stuff in and they're just moving it around, but it's like an actual TV. It's just, it's fantastic. We call it it's television. television. So it's good. just, it's, yes, it's delightful, but yeah. also again, I, well, I, it is a spatial piece of software. Yeah. Now our friend James, friend of the show, James Thompson, uh, he's got a, he's got a first like experimental beta of dice by PCALC that mm -hmm. does this too, right? Where mm -hmm. the dice tray is in your space. And like, again, it's one of those apps that I go, ah, yes, there, here we go. Right. Yep, it's software, it. but it's yep. existing in a space. This is not every piece of software needs to be that like that. Right. Like I don't need Slack to appear in a, like a, uh, in a, a frame, like you could hang it on a wall. Right. I don't need that. I yeah. don't need that. But for some stuff, I think it's a really um, fun use of yes. the of what this product is. Yes, I agree. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. With Squarespace, you can stand out from the crowd of a beautiful website, engage directly with your audience, and sell your products, services, or the content that you create. Squarespace has everything you need all in one place. Squarespace is great for many things, no matter what type of site you want to make, no matter what you're looking for. But it is also especially good for people that want to start their own businesses who are looking for something that they want to get out to the world, something that they maybe want to sell or draw someone's attention to. And one of the reasons I think it's so great is because of how simple it is. Usually when you have an idea that you want to share or a product that you want to share, you know you want to have a website, but you want to go from idea to website very quickly. And that is what Squarespace is perfect at. 
It's so simple to get started with one of their best-in-class, beautiful websites. They have designs for every category and use case. You can easily customize the look, update the content, and add features to fit your needs. It's all built with a drag-and-drop interface for desktop or mobile. You can stretch your imagination online with their system, which is known as Fluid Engine, which is built in and ready to go on any new Squarespace site. You can sell your products in an online store. That's all available to you with Squarespace. Whether you sell physical or digital goods, they have all of the tools that you need to start selling online. And then also, you can grow your business and see how things are performing with Squarespace's analytics platform. This will help you learn where your site visitors and sales are coming from and analyze which channels are most effective to you. You can improve your website and build a marketing strategy based on your top keywords or most popular products and content. Go and check it out for yourself today at squarespace.com slash upgrade. You can sign up for a free trial. You can build your entire website, and you don't need to sign up for a plan until you're ready to launch. When you are, go to squarespace.com slash upgrade, and if you use the code upgrade at checkout, you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That is squarespace.com slash upgrade, and the code upgrade when you sign up for 10% off your first purchase and to show your support for the show. Our thanks to Squarespace for their support of this show and all of Relay F. Them. Jason, what is that sound? Can you hear it uh, in the background? It's the neighing of horses. It that sounds have not like been horses fed. because saddle up, partner. It's uh. time to return to the rumor roundup. Oh, how I have missed ye. Mm. I spent so much time today just going through my uh, the, my Apple note that I save of links to just try and pick like what are we going to talk about because there are there's basically a month's worth of rumors but i've decided to pick out three different areas that we're going to talk about a little bit today in rumor roundup first mark Gurman is reporting that ios 18 could be quote the biggest update in the company's history as they mm. ready their release of ai features Previous reporting has indicated that some of these features could include a revamped Siri powered by Apple's own LLM, as well as AI infusion into the system apps, stuff like messages and music in the iWork suite to try and make them better, as well as advancements to Xcode to make development easier. So you're looking at kind of like those co-pilot kind of features to help with code completion, as well as app testing as well by using AI. Apple is also working on making Spotlight better as well, uh, as Siri. We have a quote here. Uh, Early designs of the Spotlight overhaul include using LLMs to answer more complex questions and the ability to tap deeper into apps to launch specific functions. The current version of Spotlight is mostly limited to launching apps, making basic web searches, and pulling up information. So I want to get into uh, iOS 18 AI in a bit more detail. But the first thing I wanted to say is, is Spotlight a better brand than Siri? I mean, maybe. It depends on how badly we think. Because Siri, so here's the thing. I know that especially all of us think about all the issues with Siri, but wow, more people know Siri. They know right? the name, Siri. Though, right? And they the, know like, that might the be name. The yeah. And I think the, the argument there is that I know people are like, oh, but it's negative, it doesn't work. It's like, yeah, I think you can turn that around. I think that it's. I think that the negativity of the Siri brand is kind of overemphasized and overstated in our little community, and that the most important asset is that it's known in a way that Spotlight is just is not known. Now, I mean, I, I could... I could make the argument that throwing the Siri name away and having it be all about Spotlight would be better, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like, I mean, Spotlight brand so could get elevated, but what Siri is the brand, brand people know. So I agree with you. And I'm not really advocating for just thinking about it because, like, Zach has said, uh, I don't think anybody knows Spotlight as a name. And that's kind of my point. Like, yeah. So the, 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 the Siri name is well known, people are aware of it. Apple has done a good job of, of publicizing it. It's been around for an incredibly long time. I think like a decade now, right? It started with like the iPhone 4S or something. But it hasn't got like a super positive association to it. Like people are just kind of aware of it. Like, but I, I think by and large, people are ambivalent to it. Spotlight is also a cool brand name and it's another thing that Apple has. And like, I think it's kind of cool. The reason I bring this up is just because like Apple's, uh, the majority of competitors Apple has has actually changed their names with their existing thing, right? So, like, Bing is now just Copilot, which is just, I think, a great name. 
yeah. uh, for for the for the uh, for the AI stuff, and Google hilariously introduced the name and then rebranded it. Right, so Bard became Gemini, and, and I just wonder if like with a big change like this, is it worth kind of cutting your losses a little bit because you're about to introduce something that in theory is so dramatically better than what it replaces that maybe it's best to just cut any negativity away and start over i'll i'll just say no <laughs> i don't think so i think <laughs> i think you're better off saying it's the all-new siri and it, it's so awesome and we, yeah. we revolutionized voice assistants um 10 years ago with when we introduced siri and now no, we're revolutionizing we it, again. it again and yeah. i know everybody else will be like blah 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 but it's like okay but it's apple marketing they say stuff like that but yeah. that's that idea of well this is the new siri and it's awesome and like and then so who are your competitors at that point gemini which nobody's heard of chat gpt people have heard of bard you know is gone uh copilot is a good name but again is kind of a new concept uh if if apple is integrating with their operating systems on their phones especially like siri it's already there, like the new Siri with AI, yeah. Siri AI, you could even call it if you wanted to. But like, I think you keep the name because even if there's some negative connotations with it, and I think there are some, but I don't think it's a, I don't think they've destroyed the brand or anything. I think no. it's ready to be revived by new features and people get what yeah. it means, right? Which is an assistant who will help me do things when I talk to it. I do agree with you, by the way. I, it was just, it was in reading the thing about Spotlight. Oh, I know. It was just like. It was like, oh, they do actually continue to have both of these names. Yeah. No, and maybe my, it doesn't make sense to. I think my my argumentative response, I was really arguing with some of our listeners, I think. So it's the straw man kind of thing. But I'm just sure. bear with me here. I think those of us who are so focused on Apple stuff know how bad Siri has been and know how bad it's been for so long. And it's a constant irritation to us. Whereas I think the general public uses it. And if they have a bad result, maybe they stop using it. Yeah. But that's about it, right? Like, I don't think that there is that same, like, I hate it so much. For years, I've hated Siri. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't think that is a thing. I think it's, and in marketing, the most important thing is explaining what you are to be known. It's that lesson that I was taught many years ago by one of my old bosses, who was a sales guy. But he was like, the first thing is to be known. You must be known before anybody will consider buying your thing. Well, Siri is known. It's a huge asset. You don't get rid of it just because, you know, it hasn't been so great. Because in general, the most important thing is that when you say Siri, people know what that feature is supposed to do. And you say Siri AI, and they're like, oh, they made Siri better with AI. Great. And then you're done, right? Like, all the nerds will be like but but siri has been so bad for it's like it doesn't matter anymore it's over and maybe right? I at think this point that's the it. public perception of ai is so much that if you know that siri was made better with ai you might be more willing to trust it or give it so, another go right yeah right cool so what do you think about apple's prospects of of ai in ios 18 and this idea that <sighs> it is being referred to internally as maybe their biggest update ever yeah well i, I mean i love Here's what I love about it. I love that it's Apple. Apple has been riding ho- so high for so long. And and even in the early days where they were in the early days of the iPhone, they were being pressed by Android. Right. Android was pushing a lot of buttons in terms of, oh, but we do this thing. They were, they were intentionally implementing things Apple didn't implement in order to give Android a leg up in certain areas that Apple wouldn't or couldn't implement or just hadn't. Boy, it's been a long time, right? It's been a long time since that was the case. So now Apple is riding high. They make a lot of money. The iPhone's doing great. And, you know, the smartphone velocity has slowed down. And this chatbot AI thing has really, I think, kicked Apple in its complacency. <laughs> and uh, and so I'm excited to see what they do because it does feel like they are like, oh, crap. Um, let's get this in more places and that they made a concerted effort. Now, do I think that will work out? I think the answer is some of it will work great. And it will be things like things we've been saying all along, like, why can't the iPhone do this? And the answer has really been like, Apple has chosen not to do that. And now some of that stuff is going to get eroded. It's going to get, it's going to be like, ah, but Tim Cook says AI. So the people who are against it are, are now outvoted and they're going to insert stuff in. And that's why I think Siri will be better. Because Siri's been so bad for so long, as we just discussed, 
Uh, I think in part because people involved with Siri are like, no, 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 we've just got, it's complicated. It, it's that story about it takes months to update like little decision chains and the Siri thing. And it's like, then Tim Cook says AI and they're like, all right, I guess we're throwing this away and we're doing something with AI. I assume that that will happen. And, and similarly, um, other OS features that could be simplified by using AI systems that, again, might have been like, well, deprioritized or we're waiting for it to be better. And then all of a sudden, Tim Cook says, no, now do this. And they're like, OK, I guess we'll do this now. Do I think some of them were, are going to ship and we're going to be like, what? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Yes, I do. And that'll be fun to notice when those things happen. But I, I'm I'm excited by the possibility because this is one of those areas Apple has been very... If I had to sum it up, I would say Apple has been very conservative with their implementation of machine learning stuff. Yep. They use it, but they're really conservative about it. And I think what we're going to see, uh, this is a little bit like that column I wrote about Apple getting weird. I think Apple has been caught so off guard by the advances in AI that it has been this kick to their complacency and that they are going to do some stuff that is a little outside their comfort zone with iOS. And I think it's been a long time since Apple has done something outside its comfort zone because they have felt so comfortable with their position. And they're like, no, no, no. And their conservatism about releasing new features uh, tends to override those like let's take a chance on this wild idea sometimes there are weird ideas but a lot of it is like really basic because they don't want to go overboard mm. it, you see it with their camera stuff where they're like like the magic eraser thing that google does what bugs me about the magic eraser ads for google is that i've been able to do magic eraser eraser on my ipad for ages now using uh, using photomator is what it's called now right it's pixel mater yep. photo now it's just photo mater where you literally color in the thing you want to remove and it uses machine learning and it erases the thing and replaces it with something that should fit there like it's i've, I've used that for years now um but apple has refused to put something like that in photos they just won't do it they just won't do it and this is the kind of thing where there's a kick of like no you you need to you need to do this <laughs> and i can't wait to see it some of it's going to be bad. Some of it's going to be great. That's the thing when you are are not caught off guard and have to rush to catch up. So I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a bizarre release potentially. Yes. I I and I'm 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 here for it. Right. I'm I'm here for Apple trying all sorts of weird stuff. Especially I'm I'm here for people in different areas within Apple's OS group and apps groups looking at the AI mandate and coming up with and they and they know their software really well and coming up with unexpectedly weird but good things and bad things sure bad things but like also weird but good things I think that could be great and just I I, I like Apple trying weird stuff and being hungry and, and like because the vision pro is super weird right but and it's got issues but like there's also stuff in it where you're like wow that is really smart that is really clever and it's been a little while since i've felt that way about like an ios feature it's like oh that's good that's nice they added this thing that we've been clamoring for for five years and they finally added it um but this is going to be i think more of an os release where we look at it and we're like what <laughs> and that's exciting right like what what did they do they did it's gonna do what now that's for me that's really great i i assume that you feel similarly about it yeah i'm i have so many questions about it like i and i just don't i have i'm i'm not sure how they're gonna do it right like how much is this stuff going to be on device? How much is going to be in the cloud? Like, what ramifications are there from that? Like, I'm intrigued about these things, but I'm intrigued about exactly what features they're going to have, what they're going to enable. Like, will Siri have a personality now? Like, will it be right. one person? Like, all of these little things, like, how far are they going to go? Yeah. Like, what are they willing yeah. to do? And then all yeah, of what? the drama oh, that will naturally it, like ensue from it. I, I'm, yes. I'm really intrigued. Well, we did the draft of the ages, about. right? Yeah. Where yeah. I predicted that, that there'll be a scandal about some terrible thing that yeah. one of their AI things does that I mean, they like, have to apologize for. Google's going for. through it all right now, right? Like, yeah. It, 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 it's going to be really intriguing to see how apple and its corporate culture right battle ai like right. i'm, I'm it, really intrigued by it the on device off device thing i think is really interesting because what um what i think it means is that they're going to 
try to do things on device, but mm -hmm. they're going to have some things that have to be in the cloud. Mm -hmm. They're going to make statements about how the cloud stuff is all anonymized and not logged and is personal to you, which I think is good, right? Like that they're going to want to say we're not, you know, it's our model and our data and 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 we're we're not going to do anything with your queries. Um, I do wonder like how those there might be some hybrid models where it's it's like there's an LLM that runs on the iPhone that then does web queries. It knows to do the queries, but then the queries happen remotely, and then information gets filtered back. I don't know. You're right. It, it How do they have to change either their philosophy or how they describe their philosophy in order to use this? And then, yeah, what are the pitfalls? Because, again, I think that, that one of the reasons they've been so conservative with this stuff is that they want a level of control that is not necessarily possible with this stuff right now. And so there are two choices there, which is, one, you make something that's actually not as good as the competitors because you've been so conservative with your decision-making, or you let it rip and maybe some bad things happen and how do you label it a beta do you have a footnote that says you know it's experimental and it might give you bad results i don't know what those what those things look i'm very interested in the xcode part of it too like mm -hmm. how do you train if you're apple what is your code base of swift and swift ui especially that you've trained on is it just like stuff on GitHub? Is there a lot of, basically what I'm thinking is there, is there a lot of Swift code out there that you can train this on if you're not going to train it using Apple's internal code? And a lot of apps that use Swift are not open source and the source isn't available. Like, can they train that to be a good co-pilot feature inside Xcode? I don't know. It's an interesting question. As well as AI features, Mark Gurman is reporting that iOS 18 will feature some design refresh. Gurman says the company is working to update the design of iOS, but I don't believe it will be a total overhaul that mirrors Vision OS. Mm. Makes sense. I feel like there's always you know room for refreshing, but I think history has shown don't do the whole thing at once. That can yeah. tend to be a problem. It feels like there's some design language changes that they're going to make, and we... we we will talk about this in our next segment, I believe, because yes. I think that we've gotten a, some clues about the direction they're going. Um, but not a not an overhaul. They're not trying to build. It would be I would think it would be foolish to uh, launch a brand new 1.0 product and then try to overhaul the lineup to be like it. Like I don't think that that's the plan here. I do think Vision OS things will will seep the ones that work will seep into the other products because that's how it works at Apple. Mm -hmm. But I, that seems premature right now. Yeah, I mean, like, there, there could have been things that were designed visually for Vision OS because they were going to be everywhere, right? Like, rather than it being, oh, we made it for Vision OS and it looks real good, so mm -hmm. now, like, it's our, it's what we do, you know? You know what I mean? But, uh, yeah. as you say, like, I, it would be strange if that was just the way that they went and immediately. It was like, oh, yeah, this is this is what we're going to do with our stuff. It's all going to yeah. look I like could, this. I I could see Stage Manager, especially on the iPad, looking more like Vision OS. That's an area where I feel like they could just sort of like push those things closer together. But. That'd be nice. So moving on from iOS 18, Digitimes mm -hmm. is reporting that the upcoming OLED iPad Pros may not see the huge price jumps that were rumored after all. So last year, uh, there were a lot of headlines generated when the ELAC had reported that pricing for the OLED iPad Pro models could start at $1,500 for the 11-inch and $1,800 for the 12.9-inch due to these new OLED panels. And I remember we were talking about at the time, like, that seemed too much. But if it is going to be that, well, what are you giving me for it, right? However, mm -hmm. Digitimes is now saying that they uh, predict an increase of $160 as a maximum on each current model. Okay. Uh, this would see starting prices of $950 and $1,200, respectively. I mean, it's still a lot of money for an iPad, but it's not yep. as much money as we feared. Nope. Um, right, because that was our, 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 our statement about it was very much like, how do you convince people that $1,500 for an 11-inch iPad makes sense, right? And if mm -hmm. it's $950 to start... Again, it's not cheap, right? That's that's you're getting you're in MacBook Air territory there, but it's an OLED screen. Yeah, interesting, interesting here. Keep in mind also, there's probably going to be a new Magic Keyboard, mm -hmm. and that's probably going to cost an, you know three three fifty something like. Yeah, that. you could get to fifteen hundred and eighteen hundred dollars easily. But, 
but it's not what the iPad's going to start at itself. Uh, These iPad Pros uh, are also, so 9to5 Mac reported this, they are set to get a little bit larger, but also thinner because of the OLED panels inside, with the key part being, I think, that the new iPad Pros are expected to be just 5 millimeters thick, uh, which is wild, and it's still expected that we will see them released by the end of March. Yeah, this is, I mean, they're currently six and six and a half, essentially. Mm -hmm. And they're going to go down to five, Mm -hmm. which is pretty wild. Um, Whereas the air will be six. (laughs) So uh, air doesn't mean what you think it means. But uh, it is, yeah, I mean, I love my iPad. I, I have to admit that I've been thinking, like, am I overly committed to the 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 large iPad lifestyle? Uh, and I do love that big screen, but it is bigger. Um, but then I see a story like this and I think, hmm, maybe it's okay. Yep. <laughs> right. Because uh, uh, maybe, I don't yeah. know, I wonder what the weight change will be, if at all. I wonder. Um, but that thinness is pretty, pretty awesome. Going back to Mark Gurman reporting now in his Power On newsletter, Mark has said that Apple started work, uh, early work, on a home part of a screen. The yeah, device- this is almost like it. A wet blanket kind of thing, because we've talked about this before, yeah. and he said that they were working on it. And this report seems to be very much like nobody get their hopes up. This is not a 20, 2024 thing, right? This is like it's out there. This is a thing that they're 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 trying out, mm-hmm. but it's not something that's shipping imminently. Because I think that maybe some reports made it made people too excited, like they were, oh, yeah. they're testing it and they're getting ready to ship it. And he's like, no, 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 that is not what's happening. It's going to be a lot further out. So don't get your hopes up. Yeah, part of this reporting was that 9to5Mac found references to such a device existing in a tvOS 17.4 beta. It was referencing like a screen and and a HomePod in tvOS, which like, doesn't make any sense unless they're testing something like this because no such product exists. Um, and it is still expected that this device would be some combination of an Apple TV, a HomePod, and an iPad with a FaceTime camera. So, all sounds I, good. I think that really the key is like good audio, right? So HomePod, yep. A FaceTime camera, so you can call people. The yep. iPad part is just it has a touch screen, but the operating yep. system looking and feeling like tvOS, like that makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. That whole kind of stack of things to do. Simplified operating system. There are apps for it. You could do FaceTime and Zoom on it, right? Like they've got all that stuff in there because the tvOS stuff with continuity camera. And it's like, well, that's interesting, but you got to have continuity camera. But if there is a product behind it that has an integrated camera and runs tvOS, it makes a lot more sense. And the software is already there for it at that mm-hmm. point. So there's a lot. There's a lot to be said for this. Let me tell you what I want this device to do, but we're very, very far away from that if it ever happening. I want this to be an eye tracking focused device. Like Oh, interesting. If I'm in the kitchen, I'm usually busy. My hands are dirty, I'm cooking, whatever. To use yep. a device like this, yes, I could use my voice, but I would also like to be able to look at it and tap with my fingers. Like I've I also felt like I want to do this with my watch too right like because the the apple watch we always wanted to be a one-handed device it's how we thought about it before oh it's a one-handed device right it's simple but it's not it's two hands it it is more two-handed than anything else that you use but wouldn't it be nice if you could look at your watch and just use the single tap motion that it should potentially be able to detect to do things in the watch like we're far away from technology like that, but right. I also, I mean, a few years ago, wouldn't have imagined that they could have so, eye tracking so good on the on the on the vision. So now, keep in mind that the eye tracking is right by your eye, and this thing is yep. across the kitchen from you. But yep. I, I think that there are things that they could learn. So my Google Nest Home, whatever it is, has a very limited gestural support. It basically means that I don't have to tell it to stop the alarm or tap on the screen. I can actually wave my hand at it and it turns the alarm off. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it, maybe there's something like a combination of hand gestures and um, and maybe even like attention sense. So if you think about the idea that like if you're looking at it, can it determine, does it have an ML model of like, oh, now it's looking at me 
and then you do a command and it, right. with a gesture and it does it. That's not eye tracking. What if like per se. you could you know like uh, you could I don't know TVOS right is very big like the the point you know yeah. W- what if you it had some kind of thing like some kind of like radar thing in it like that that pixel had <laughs> where you could just move your hand right and it's and it's just selecting what you're looking at like well, you there sur- are things to do. Yeah, maybe, or maybe it's maybe it's the motion, right? Like, because mm-hmm. TVOS is very much like uh, left, right, up, down, select for most stuff. So if you can imagine that maybe it only triggers when you're looking at it, and then you've got hand gestures for which would be very easy, I would think, for left, right, up, down, and enter. You could, you, you know, so you could basically go like right, right, move your finger, right, right, and then go, you know, with your palm of your hand or something, go boop. And it selects a thing like you could there might be a simple set of those kind of gestures for when you're you want to be hands free and not putting your oily, you know, chickeny, whatever they are, hands on the screen, which is super gross in the kitchen. So I think there's potential there. And they have this tech. You know, let's just keep that out of the kitchen. Well, I mean, salmonella might be in the kitchen. Keep it off your screen for sure. Yeah, and watch well, I mean, you're more hands. likely to get it if you're just putting your like gross chicken ha- chicken hands on the screen. Exactly, you should be keep it contained. You know? Keep keep the, your your contaminants contained. You don't mm-hmm. want them on the screen of your device. It's right there, you know, contaminant contain. Right, you should be, it's the clues in the name. That's, um, yeah, finally, go. iPhone schematics and leaked production molds suggesting that the iPhone 16 will feature a vertical arrangement of the two camera lenses. Clearly, this is for special video. Clearly. Right, Very because clearly. Yeah. they have been horizontally aligned from each other for years now, yep. and now they would be uh, vertically aligned. Right, aligned, you know, uh, diagonally. Sorry, not horizontally. Diagonally aligned from each other, right? And in, in the little uh, square right. on the iPhone 16 for a long time. But if you if you have one right, right on top of the other, then you have the ability to flip the phone on its yep. side and capture spatial video. Yep. There are also rumors that suggest the iPhone 16 will gain both an action button and the rumored capacitive capture button, uh, which is interesting to me that they would put they yeah. would put the action button straight on that phone and then immediately I, as well if they're going to add this capture button this year that there's a possibility of it coming to both phones hmm. at the same time. I think Apple is much more aggressive taking things off the Pro and putting them on the main models than we give them credit for. Mm-hmm. This episode is brought to you by Uni Pizza Ovens. Uni is the world's number one pizza oven company, letting you make restaurant-quality pizza in your own home. Uni Pizza Ovens can reach up to 950 degrees Fahrenheit and cook pizza in as little as 60 seconds. This incredibly high temperature is what separates these pizzas that you'll make in an Uni from those that you can make in a conventional home oven. And they're super quick to heat up as well. You'll be ready to go in just 20 minutes, which is enough time to get all of your pizza toppings ready to go. Do you love an authentic wood-fired flavor? How about the convenience of cooking with gas? Well, whether you like to cook with wood, charcoal, gas, or even electricity, there is an uni oven that fits your need and lifestyle. Uni Uni designed ovens like the Wood Pellet Fueled Fire 12 and the Multi Fueled Karu 12G for maximum portability. It's made for those who like cooking on the go, camping, and getting out into the wilderness. But if you want the convenience of gas but love the flavor of wood fired cooking, Uni's Karu line has you covered because you can use wood or charcoal right out of the box or get the optional gas burner for cooking flexibility. And now, Uni's electric Volt 12 pizza oven means that you can make pizza both indoors and outdoors. Uni ovens are for more than just pizza, though. You can cook juicy burgers, sizzling fajitas, buffalo wings, and so much more. They are ovens. That's what they are, but they're perfect for pizza and everything else. Uni Pizza Ovens start from just $299 with free shipping to the US, the UK, and the EU. They also make cast iron cookware, pizza peels, thermometers, and loads of other accessories to help you level up your cooking. Jason, can you tell our listeners a little bit about the convenience when you come to using your Uni Pizza Oven? Oh, convenience. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, It is, well, I mean, the idea here is that you can set it up outside I have the gas powered one and uh, it uses the same gas cylinder as my gas grill. So I don't have to have like I've got two of those, one attached to each. But if one runs out, I can just flip over to the other one. It's super easy. Actually, the same as also our outdoor heater thing. So it's like it's all kind of the same containers, which yeah. is really nice. The propane. 
Um, and then uh, it doesn't in the summertime. It doesn't heat up the house because it's outside, so I don't make as much pizza. Yep. Like in the oven, I got to get it up, and I can only get it up to five hundred. And it just the whole house is hot. So the summer, it's just a no go. Um, don't have to worry about that. I can get the oven much hotter outside, and it doesn't heat up the house. And then the speed, as you mentioned, uh, you can cook it once you get it up to to temp. Um, really, not only does that make it easy to cook multiple pizzas because um, they're all done within a very short time of one another. Mm-hmm. You just put it in, and you can you actually use the peel like to turn it around a little bit, and it's got this L-shaped burner that lets it get all crispy and melty and all of that. Um, it, it you know so it can be done in a minute or two, and then you put the next one in, and it's done in a minute or two, and then you sit down. And you've got two different pizzas with different toppings, and it's just it's all uh, very pleasant and convenient. And then I have a little I bought the little case for it, so now when it's very rainy. Um, I just keep it outside, but I've got it in its little uh, little case. Yeah, I'm very excited because Uni has sent me one of the electric ones. Oh man, so that, that's on its way. So next time we talk about this, I'll be able. To, I will be able to tell you what it's like to use the unbelievable uh, Volt Twelve. Uh, I liked the idea of in. cooking inside and outside. That was that mm-hmm. was very appealing to me. Yeah. Listeners of this show can get 10% off their purchase of an Uni pizza oven. Just go to uni.com and use the code UPGRADE2024 at checkout. Uni pizza ovens are the best way to bring restaurant quality pizza to your own home. So go to ooni.com, that's uni.com, and use the code UPGRADE2024 for 10% off. A thanks to Uni pizza ovens for their support of this show and Relay FM. Apple has launched a sports scores app. And it Jason has. had the chance to talk to Eddie Q about it. What a what I a did. Great I time talked to Eddie one on one. I mean, there was other Apple PR people about it, but it was just me and Eddie talking. Yeah, you know, just hanging out with Eddie Q. First time for me, I've ever talked to Eddie Q. Honestly, was it a good time? It seemed like yeah. a good time. I think Eddie Q is exactly who you expect him to be. Who you see him as. He yep. he uh, he seems really smart, but also like a real person. He cares about sports. Obviously, that was in my story. I basically said, look. You know one thing about Eddie, it's like he cares about sports. He's at courtside at the Warriors games. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I talked to him, he had just come back from the Super Bowl. <laughs> like uh, li- literally that morning he had come back from the Super Bowl. It was the day after the Super Bowl. Um, and uh, and so to do this app and have, have a, like a sports score app, like clearly it's driven by his personal passion for this subject and frustration. One of the things that he and I talked about, he was like, well, where do you get your scores? And I said, honestly, I've given up on score apps. I just use Google. And he says, yes, <laughs> he basically is like, yes, this is the problem huh. is that, that, that the apps. And I think he's right. The apps that you make for sports scores are generally to the focus is on something else. They're trying to get you to do something else, subscribe to their thing or use ad. their betting app or you know there's so many other things that yeah. they or just or just load you in with ads yeah. and he was like we just wanted to make something that gets you to the scores fast and that was our whole like charter for this thing that was obviously coming out of his group and probably a very small group of people and they're, they're like it's a passion project for them but i think that there's also behind it there's a lot of strategy going on so it's really interesting it, even if you're not interested in sports or sports scores, I think it's interesting in how it's built and how it interlinks with other stuff Apple's doing and how Apple maybe can do some do something that starts simple but also has a lot of potential for interlinking with other things Apple's doing. So as uh, Eddie says, and I quote, I just want the damn score of the game. Yep, that's what it's he said to me. It's one of the greatest quotes <laughs> from Apple executive of all yeah, time. they let... They, and they, and they said, you know, when you talk to Eddie, the top part of it before we get into the demo is on the record. And I'm like, when he said that, I was like, well, that's not something they'd put in a press release. And I love it because that's it, right? I just want the damn score. Mm-hmm. That's what I want. And and yep. I mean, he said, I, he said he was literally standing courtside at the Warriors games where he where he has tickets, and uh, and looking at the scoreboard and looking at the app when it was in beta, and sending notes back about how long the app was delayed from what the real time was. Because part of the goal of this was not only f- to get you the scores fast, but get them to be not super laggy. He wants the data source to be as current as possible. Yeah. Um, What's you know, going you on can't with do that real data time, source? Because like that, but, that was a thing, yeah. right, that you were mentioning in the article, and I've heard other people mention. Apple seems to have some some kind of very very fast data source like something's going on yeah. here do you know what what's going on there like do you know I anything don't, about it 
I don't know what their data sources are. I think they've got different partners. I think that one of the reasons why there are certain sports that are in there and certain sports that aren't, some of that has to do with like what's like there's everybody's like, oh, I can't add my favorite NFL team. It's like, guys, there's no NFL scores until August. So hold on. But um, I get it on one level. But on another level, I get why they're like, no, we're not going to do that now. Um, but I think some of the lower leagues um, in in like it, it released in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. and yep. and in the U.K. one of the things that people pointed out is it's just the Premier League, um, and and there, it probably should have some of the lower leagues in there too. I think that has to do with the data source. That's my suspicion is that they're not happy, and they may even have some standards for like how quickly the data source right. updates. And if the data source isn't very good, my guess is that they're pushing their data source providers because they want that data, but they're launching with the data that they're comfortable with because they want to show off that they've got a good data source. The other funny thing about the data source is this is not a new data source. If you have had favorite teams in Apple News or Apple TV before, you've been getting live activities and can con continue to get them for those teams on your lock screen of your iPhone. That's the same data source. Like I, I got up uh, a couple days before I went down and talked to Eddie and Arsenal was playing. It was actually the day before because it was Sunday. They played the morning of Super Bowl Sunday. And... You know, I'm walking out to get my tea in the morning and on my iPhone in standby, it instead of it being like the clock and the weather, it's the Arsenal score and a play by play of the Arsenal game. And I thought to myself, oh, yeah, right. Live activities. And in fact, you know, now that uh, spring training has started, I'm getting those live activities for the Giants as well. And what's funny is that those scores aren't in the scores app. And I think that, again, this is one of those cases where their live activities uh, data feed has some spring training data in it, but the sports app isn't yet. I think that they've got stuff they want to do to properly present baseball, and they're waiting for the regular season to properly present it because they've got a. It's not just the score; it's also like the pages that have like the box score and stats and stuff. And I think that they. Uh, I, I don't think that's ready. They also have a March Madness thing that they're going to do for the NCAA basketball tournaments. Um, that he said that, you know, that that would be specific to that and they'll push that out for the tournaments. So uh, there was clear intent here that this thing is going to get updated a lot. Uh, and, uh, and that is not just presentation, but it's also the data sources. So I think that there's there's more here. But um, but when I say this, I mean, it also talks about the fact that this is kind of a, a it's kind of funny, right? Because the data source is already there. It's in the TV app. And then I heard a lot of people say, well, why aren't they doing things like with the Stocks app where you're basically like reading news about your stocks that you're following in the Stocks app? But like you read news about the teams you're following in the news app and that all syncs. And like, so on one level, that makes sense. On another level, I wonder if the long term play, like this app is not called Apple Scores, right? It's called Apple Sports. So I wonder if the long term plan is to integrate more of that stuff into one app it's but a right brand. now it's sort this of is, this three is apps. the brand it's not it as you say it's not it's not sports scores it's apple sport like apple tv apple like apple weather yeah. like all of these things like, exactly and we'll talk exactly. in a minute about like i want to talk to you in a minute about like boulder ambitions and stuff um mm -hmm. i mean this is interesting like yeah i my main sport is formula one that's not in here and i think not i feel there. like i understand why i don't even think Heart, this is a data thing i think that they're is gonna just have to a build a completely custom, different way of yeah. showing scores yeah. of something yeah. and it i'm isn't sure really scores there's not really scoring uh, yeah i'm sure they will get there right because i'm sure they would like to harness uh f1 fans and get them in but it is yeah it's a different paradigm that they have to build and and i can see why they would leave it out at the first version it's a little less when they have soccer scores in there it's a little less to be like well why isn't the championship in there and why isn't the champions league in there a, you know you're saying about the data but i reckon it's like how much money is in the is in the system right and like premier league Could has be. more money they can maybe have better better, better data better real-time data if, because yeah. the data exists but if apple is sure. very like very fixed on this like it's got to be uh, uh, immediately fast or whatever, then right. that's going like to cause them a problem. Doesn't it sound like them? For them to have yes. a higher standard and it means that things get omitted from their app and people complain about it, but they're like, no, yeah. <laughs> we have a higher standard. And then there's a question of like, will they... will they get people to raise the bar for the data sources? Will they lower their bar a little bit for some of the other scores? Who knows? But they're going out with the data sources 
that they think are first off are the biggest ones yeah. and that probably the best ones. So it is the NBA and the MLS. Of course, it launched on MLS opening day. That's why it launched when it did. Clearly, was that. But they've yeah. got MLS, NBA, NHL, uh, Premier League, a bunch of other European soccer. Even though it didn't launch in other European countries, um, I, I I think. It was strongly implied to me that Luca Maestri, the CFO at Apple, really wanted Serie A to be in there. <laughs> okay. So, you know, there's a lot of people who follow European leagues who are not the top level leagues. But again, the lower level leagues well, aren't there. Come on it's, in, Phil. It's a starting I know place. Phil Schiller is a big Formula One fan. So I know, right? Why, I think it's, why I think doesn't Phil get this treatment? You know? I think it's harder. I think that's the answer, right? It it's is like harder. it's a completely different way to visualize yeah. data for, for races. Uh, than it is for they, there a is an app match. out there called Box Box that Apple should just buy that team because they've done mm. it like they've built a live activity for Formula One races which is like it's so good like it updates live with times See? and lap numbers and stuff like it's a different way of, of showing things one of the things that I find super interesting and I find it quite complicated and very strange at the same time is that it has betting betting lines betting information yeah. right the odds on games are in mm-hmm. this app in the app i don't know why they've done that well i can tell you I, I can tell you why which is in the u.s right now an enormous amount of attention and money is happening with legal sports gambling legal sports gambling is new in most yep. of the u.s yep and there's a huge amount of money in there and i think that what happened is there is a perception that betting is a part of the sports market and the sports audience, and so they didn't want to ignore it. I think but five years ago, this bet. wouldn't have happened. <laughs> you can't bet. No, you can't in bet in it. So no, it just shows you is that the useful odds. To you? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a better, so I can't okay. tell you. I think I maybe think there's people, like who's favored. Yeah, some people like to know that, right? right? Yeah, but there's it is it's okay. So it's weird to me because it's Apple, right? Yeah, like, like then again. The the I'll just point out again when they launched the Major League Baseball stuff, their pregame show was sponsored by a betting company. So like wow. Apple has been yep. involved with with sports betting, and I I know people feel differently about it. There there is, as far as I can tell from the reaction that I saw on Mastodon, I think in mainland Europe there is a very strong anti betting opinion. But I will just say that in the U.S. and the U.K., actually, where these things have launched, and I don't know about how Canada feels, um, there it, it's it is a part of the culture, and it's very not a normal. part that I am yeah. a part of, but it is yeah. very normal. I I'm really just surprised that it either doesn't ask or that it doesn't put the setting in the app itself. You have to go to settings and then drill down all the way into the sports app and then turn it off. But you can turn it off. And I didn't even have to ask. It was on my list of questions to ask about. And before I could in the demo, they're like, you can turn it off. It's there if you want it yep. and you can turn it off. It's weird to me that they've done it. It's weird. You say they've partnered with DraftKings? Apparently it this? is the data source. It says that it's the data source. Yeah. It's, but it's also strange to me that you you can't do anything with it. Yeah, it say, okay, it says it in settings. Sports settings, betting odds powered, are provided by DraftKings. So it says that yeah. in the settings app. It doesn't say mm-hmm. it in the, in the thing. And nope. you can't do anything with that. It's just nope. they, that's where they have the, the data. So I yeah. guess for DraftKings, this is just a way to make money. But So let's talk about some, some of the future of this. Like, and I'll okay. start with that question. Is Can you imagine a world where Apple's into sports betting? Mm, not really. Um, okay. but I think, I think that it's possible that there might be a partnership or out, uh, or links out. I have a hard time imagining that they would, they would do it more than that. Um, I think that they'll keep it at arm's length. Um, it's possible that they will allow, like, cause th- then they would be linking to third party apps. I don't think it'll be in the app at all. So I think this is probably the most it'll be. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they scale it back a little bit based on reaction from people. Um, like, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I, like I said, I don't, I don't really understand the psychology of people who are focused on betting for sports, but I know that it's a huge part of the audience and they want to capture that audience. I'm not sure that audience needs to see the odds in the app Yeah, that's that, because that's they're the probably seeing the odds in their betting me. app yeah. anyway. 
So I don't I don't know if I entirely understand this part of it. I don't I, I doubt Maybe it will like, be a direction for them. If you're that person, like if you're using the sports app because you like it and then you notice the odds change maybe during the game that maybe you'll want it. But I don't even know if that's a thing that happens. I don't know. It's weird. It is weird. I think it's the weirdest part of this. And to yeah. me it's like an intro it's interesting because it's like this is a nice app, like and, and and then a lot of the conversation has been focused around Apple and sports betting, which is just like, you know, it's own thing. Um, one oh, by the, the way, thing- by the way, one of the things that uh, our our dear video producer Chip um, pointed out to us just now, which I I alluded to, but I didn't mention in detail, um, sports betting is only legal in certain states in the U.S. Right. So if they were to want to interlink in the U.S., they would have to do like geography down to the state level and stuff. And I I think that honestly, direct betting links in the app alone was a line too far, but certainly it adds enormous complexity if you go beyond that. But I think that, I don't think that they want to do it. No. Um, But you mentioned linking out. One of the things that this app does is if there is a service, a streaming service um, that that's connected to Apple TV, it's connected to Apple TV that is showing the game that you're looking at live. You can tap a button to take you to the app. To take you it. to the TV app. To TV app to watch it. Take you to the TV app from which you can go to the provider or uh, start a live activity from the TV app Okay. for that event. So basically the link in the sports app is open an Apple TV app. And then in the TV app, you can watch it if you have an interlinked thing mm-hmm. or you can follow the live activity if they mm-hmm. offer a live activity for it. Um, which is weird, right? Because... It's a bunch of extra taps and and in a different app, but that's how they built it right now because those features already exist, right? They're already in the TV app, so they're just sort of like, I don't know whether this is a philosophy that Apple wants to follow broadly, which is a whole bunch of small focused apps that interconnect, or if it's more just a function of this app being built late, after that those features are elsewhere. And so for now, they're just interlinking, but that the goal in the long term would be to integrate it all in the app itself. Um, six and one half dozen of, of another yeah. right now. I can see the advantage of both. Uh, on Upgrady Award winning, my favorite podcast, The Town, uh, Matt Bellany of, of Puck, was his prediction that he made at the end of the episode is that this is the beginning of Apple wanting to become like the mega content provider. And like, this is their beginning of that of like mm. everybody come to us and, and you know, we'll program all of this for you in our applications and people like in Apple sports, right. That they would yeah. become the, the, like the, the program guide for this. And I th- listening to it and I was yeah. like, that's a great idea, but I don't believe people are going to let them. <laughs> like, I don't think that, I think if that was the case, then the TV app would be more successful than it is. But maybe for sports, it is more successful than it is for other types maybe. of content. I, I would actually argue that this is a great leg up for the TV app because people are going to be more interested in sports who might not even know that the TV app knows what their favorite teams mm-hmm. are and can immediately take them to the app that's got that team team's game live. Mm-hmm. And if you're thinking like people are the future of sports is people watching on their iPhones, let's say, then having a, a scores app that will immediately or through a second app, which is why I think that ideally you can't, you, you've got to integrate it into this app directly, but like using that data to say, Oh, well you've got max. So you can see this game on it's the NBA on TNT. That's, that's how I did it when I was testing this out on the, on the first or second day I was out. It's like there was an NBA game on mm-hmm. and I have max, which means for now, at least I have the bleacher report add on cause it's, it's, they're giving it away for a limited time. Uh, and it just put me into the NBA game that I was looking at that was live. Um, there, that is potentially pretty powerful, right? Because um, if you're those di- those sources, whether it's a, a something like YouTube TV or Fubo or or Hulu Plus, or whether it's uh, Paramount Plus with the CBS stuff and or the the Spulu thing that might happen, which, which is the joint venture that might be coming this fall. Um, if if Apple can be the premier sort of like we know what sports you care about and we can get you to the video or the score or whatever as quickly as possible there's value in that and it, and it makes more sense for that to come out of the sports app than it does to come out of the sports area 
of the TV app because it's not even a tab, right? It's a scroll down on the iPhone. On the on the Apple TV, it is a tab. But on the iPhone, it's a sort of scroll down until you get to the sports and then tap sports and then it takes you to the sports page, which is not quite as exciting. No. Do you think that this is also just a continuing signal that they would like to have more content of their own? Like more than just MLS? Like Apple Sports um, is like they want more leagues. Yeah, they want more. I think I think they do, but I think they also want to be an aggregator of other people's content, right? Yep. I think that they I think they do want to have some sports content of their own and they find value in that. But, you know, when you think about how many iPhones are out there and also potentially doing this on Apple TV, although there's some questions about the success of that. But how many iPhones out, are out there? And maybe we throw in iPads, but especially the iPhone. Having all of your sports, like knowing your favorite teams and having Apple be the mediator to say, oh, this favorite team is now on, especially with the, the sports world fractured like it is, where like, oh, where is my favorite team's game? It's on ESPN tonight, but then, to, then Friday night it's on Apple. And in the meantime, it's on local cable that I get through YouTube TV or whatever, right? Like it gets really fractured. So if you're Apple and you can say, hey, we know where it is. Just tap on, you know, just come to the Scores app. We know your favorite team, and we know that they're live right now, and you tap, and we'll play that game, no matter what app it's in, because they're at the higher level, kind of above the apps. Um, I think there might be something there. Mm. We read a quote from John Gruber. The design language of Apple Sports is new. I wouldn't say sports looks much like journal, but they're similar insofar as they're both using a new, very simple, very focused UI design language. Sports is closest aesthetically, perhaps, to Apple Weather. It does have a very different look to it. It does. To it does an an app that Apple makes, as did Journal. Like both of these applications, they feel like mm. they are much more designed for the purpose of the application than trying to follow any specific set of rules. Mm -hmm. I agree. I do wonder if there are going to be things in this app that we look at in the next version of iOS and go, oh, yeah, this, this look, looks kind of like the sports app now. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe all the, the what, what it says is that Apple is let, willing to let all of their apps look the way they do that best fits them and that they don't need to be as unified as they were before. Um, certainly their goal is to have it be a rich graphic treatment right which is something that it's got in common with like the weather app i think they want them to feel really nice and have lots of graphics and a lot of color like one of the things that they kept emphasizing to me was the fact that they're picking up the colors of the teams mm -hmm. and using them as highlights so like even out on the top level if you're watching the celtics they'll be green and if you're watching the warriors they're going to be blue or blue and yellow like that they're that they're going to pick up since color is one of the, the big identifiers in a lot of teams, they're going to pick up those, those colors and, and use them. Um, the, yeah, it's just interesting to see, is this a design playground for them where they're like, don't worry about it. Just make a beautiful sports app. Or, or are they thinking sort of like, this is where all of Apple's apps are going. I don't know. It's a nice moving gradients, like little flags and stuff in the application. When you open mm -hmm. it up, it looks very materially, there's movement, there's life in it, but it's also simplicity to it. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, I'll be keen to see if and how this kind of thing proliferates. But what I do like, and I do like the idea of just making these applications look the best they can for the thing they are, rather than yeah. like follow these very specific set yeah. of guidelines. Every tab, everything's got to have tabs on the bottom. They got to look the same. But it this is a shame that on the this bottom. is another app that's iPhone only same as journal it is it is iphone only i think that is interesting too right in terms of the prior apple's priorities that um although for this app i think my argument would be it's meant for you to check on sports scores while you're on the go and the sure. iphone is the primary place where you but do your, that your but ipad I also, is yeah. nice for if you're at home and it's it's game day I, and there's like 12 games on and you want to keep track of them all you know you could have yeah. like loads of them all at once, right? So you could watch the play by play of multiple things on your iPad. It's quad yeah. box, but on steroids, you know, but like mm, data. No, quad steroids box. aren't allowed in sports. Sorry. Well, they're they're illegal. On the sidelines, maybe. 
you know? Mm. Who can stop you? No. One last mm-hmm. thing on sports. This comes from a press release about MLS, the season opener for MLS. Coming soon, all Apple Vision Pro users can experience the best of the 2023 MLS Cup playoffs with the first ever sports film captured in Apple Immersive Video. Viewers will feel every heart-pounding moment in 8K 3D with a 180-degree field of view and spatial audio that transports them into each match. Right. So this is something that, honestly... It is very clear that this is harder than they thought it would be because the new MLS season has started and this isn't out yet. And this is the kind of thing you release to build the hype for the new MLS season because it's the highlights from the playoffs of last season. And it's not out yet. Instead, it's like a... Oh, yeah, I didn't in, realize the it, 23 thing. Yeah, this is ages yeah, ago. <laughs> yeah, this is, this, is, this is last year's, last fall's playoffs. Um, October to December 2023. Yeah, they have a documentary about it, right? Which I'm really looking forward to seeing. But the way you the, the best time to release this was shortly after the Vision Pro releases. You release this, and it gets people hyped about soccer and Vision Pro and the MLS package that's on mm-hmm. Apple TV Plus. And instead, it's a footnote in their press release saying, "Oh, coming later." Will you can while this this season is going on, you can relive the end of last season. Yeah. So I feel like at uh, least Chuck it Gruber seems like this, this is going to yep. be a free thing. Like this isn't going to be like for MLS subscribers. Yeah, all, they say all all Apple Vision Pro That's users, cool, right? At least. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's such a small user base now, and they want to show yeah, sure. show off as much immersive content as they can. John Gruber likened this to uh, the NFL Films stuff, where you get like superior NFL Films started in the seventies, uh, making you know, recording on film, uh, football games, they would bring their own cameras. And then, it, so it was all of a much higher quality than the than the primitive sort of TV shoots of the day. And they had slow-mo that was beautiful, like cranked up slow motion of on film. And and so those were not ready later that day, right? But they, whether it was Monday Night Football halftime highlights or it was like there was a, a show during the week that was all highlights that was based on the NFL films highlights. And then in the long run, it would be their documentaries about the history of football. And they had this huge film archive. It makes the history of the NFL seem so much more majestic because they aren't just using stuff from a TV broadcast. This feels a little like that, where if they can get this right, it's probably not going to be a live broadcast, right, to start. Mm-hmm. It's probably way too complicated to do that. But the idea of immersive highlights uh, is a great one. But the turnaround, like the turnaround, because the MLS Cup playoff stuff, it's the end of February now, and they still don't have it. So they're obviously struggling with how the production process of yep. doing uh, an immersive documentary about MLS. They haven't been able to do it. So... Because the I'm trying to look the December 9th was the final, right? So yes. they've had all of their footage presumably since December 9th. It's been more than two months and it's not here. My guess is that they wanted it here last week and they couldn't do it. So we'll watch. We'll watch that because like I'm fascinated by oh, I'm excited how immersive content rolls out. And yeah, it's yeah. gonna look great. Even though I don't really care about MLS, I'm very excited about uh what you know seeing more than those two short clips in the demo reel yep. of immersive sport because that is exciting if you enjoy upgrade and would like more upgrade there's a very easy way to get that just go to getupgradeplus.com and subscribe to upgrade plus if you do you get longer versions every week we have bonus content for every single episode in fact you can go back through the entire back catalog if you subscribe and you can listen to every single segment we've done over the last four years nearly where we have extra content at the end of the show and uh, we've done some good ones recently uh, i think it was last week or the week before we uh we ranked the environments in vision pro that was a lot of fun and reading the descriptions mm-hmm. that app that jason found online that was a lot Oof. of fun so you can go back and listen to those uh, on this week's episode i want to understand how and where jason is storing his vision pro from a day-to-day perspective we're going to talk about what it's oh. like to manage that oh no yeah uh, you also get access to tons of benefits including bonus content we have m- members on these shows that are for all relay fm members we have uh, backstage and uh, spotlight 
which are two shows on backstage. Me and Stephen talk about the behind the scenes at Relay FM on Spotlight. Kathy Campbell interviews a Relay FM host uh, each month. They're a lot of fun. You get access to the Relay FM members Discord, where you can hang out with listeners just like you. Um, on uh, and talk about a variety of things. It's a really great community. You get all of this and so much more if you subscribe to Upgrade Plus. Go to getupgradeplus.com and you will get ad-free episodes every single week with bonus content too at getupgradeplus.com. It helps support the show too. Thank you so much if you sign up. I have some Ask Upgrade questions to finish out today's episode. I have two, We're going to start with two questions about Vision OS window management. Which is, I think, okay. going to be very complicated to explain. Some Hot topic. Stuff, but Hot topic. Doug writes in to say, every three months when I do my business activity statements here in Australia, I don't know what that means, but maybe to Australians that's like an important thing. Uh, I open up the Numbers app and rotate my studio display vertically. Can I rotate my Mac vertically in the Vision OS environment? I don't think so. I don't think I don't you know. can. I don't think you can. Maybe if you so. change the go into the settings and change the aspect ratio thing, but like, it's if you can, it's not easy to do that. But what I would say is you can you can make the numbers app all tall and skinny if you like, like if that's the thing that you want to do the most, and you could have that alongside. Right, and then, and yeah, or or blow up the you know make it tall and skinny, but also mm-hmm. blow up the screen. But I don't know if you can actually rotate it. That's an interesting idea. My guess is not, but I haven't tried that. Yeah, I don't think you can do that. But you could have the num like the Vision OS Numbers app. You could have up. Yeah, right? next and that's to, next the beauty, that. the beauty of um or or Excel. If you use that, it's yep. that's a Vision OS app, a uh, native app. Um, because I think Numbers is Numbers a native app or is it an iPad app? I think it's an iPad mm-hmm. app, but it's I that. Think it's an iPad I think app. Keynote is the only native one, and um, yeah, Pages yeah. So, and, and and Numbers are compatible. Or if you use Excel, then you could use that too. I'd say, yeah, Vision OS actually excels at, ha- huh? at having vertical windows. I love mm-hmm. making like really tall windows because uh, it's not a thing that you do so much on a horizontal screen. Um, so that's that's kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, if if you uh, need to use the Mac, I would say make your window tall. And uh, and and we don't have an answer for his actual question about this. It, that would be a fun thing to do. It would be nice if you had the ability to make a Mac screen vertical because the Mac can do it. So why wouldn't you be able to do it? Sims writes in to say, can you angle windows in Vision OS, say like a drafting table or an airport, airport departure board? You don't have the ability to change the... Well, I don't even know how to describe it, right? You can go like, <laughs> how do you describe movement in a 3D space? Like, you, okay, you can move them kind of a little bit, like uh, 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 left, right, but not up, down. So, so what what I would say is the the windows are around you, right? Yeah. It actually you have you, you have like a bubble. You're sitting in like and, a ball, and the windows are painted on on the ball. Yeah, so you're you're when you put one off to the left, it doesn't put it off to the left at the same flat angle that the one in front of you. It turns it so that if you put a bunch of them, they're kind of like all angles around you. Um, so so the idea of like tilting a window up so it's like at a perspective is not a thing that generally is done on this. However, I will say there's one interesting thing that, that Vision OS does, which is um, if, if for stuff that's on your sides, if you if you've got the window moving, if you're holding the window, and you tilt your head, it will actually rotate that window a little yeah, bit. Yeah, which I've been I do right. that with the Mac a lot because it I I want the Mac to be like dead straight in front of me, and sometimes it's like a little left or right, so a you little. just like grab the thing and move your body, which is moving your head, and I, and it will it will shift it a little bit. Right, I do it where I've got something off to the side, and it's not at the same angle as like the door of my house or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I'll tilt so that it's sort of like in the right angle for that. But it's it's not, but because it's a bubble around you. So the drafting table example, I actually think it sort of does that. Where if I take you a Mac very display close. Yeah. and I bring it down to yeah. right where my keyboard is on my laptop, yes, it feels like it's tilted coming out it of my does. laptop yeah. it's not it's not because it's because it's trying to be at a straight in front of my vision so if it's down below it's going to be sort of like tilted back so that it's straight in front of your vision 
um, if you can imagine that. And then if you place it right in front of you, it's going to seem flat. And then if you place it above you, it's going to seem like it's sort of tilted down toward you. Because in the end, you are in that bubble, in that ball, where all the windows are trying to be flat facing your eyes, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like th- what the system is trying to do is make it that like if you're in a stationary position, wherever you turn your head, the 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 window is basically flat to your to you. So if you look up, that it, you should be able to see it kind of like face on, so it will tilt towards you when you move the app up. It's complicated, but yeah, if you imagine yourself sitting inside of a ball and and the windows are rendered on the inside of the ball, that's what does it. We'll find out. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you it, you maybe you'll find out if that makes sense to you or not. Uh, and James asks, you often say that Apple News doesn't provide you with the content that you want, but I'm curious what you use for day to day news reading. I use Apple News, but only because I haven't found a better alternative. It took quite a lot of training to get it right, but less effort than following the right people on social media or RSS. Um, so, James, I don't believe two things. One, I don't believe it took less effort than what I do. And two, I don't have a lot of faith that I would get it right if I used Apple News. Apple News to me seems like a, a, a product built for people who use news in a very different way than I do and are interested in things I'm not interested in. And when I use it, I try to tell it, don't use these stupid sources and don't, don't do this. And the fact is, I look at that and think, how long am I going to have to use a terrible product that doesn't, that doesn't tell me what I want to see before it gets better? And I have no faith in it doing that. The, the, the launch experience, the stuff it shows me, I hate it. I just hate that stuff. It's the stuff I don't want to see from news. It's like, oh, you're a news consumer. Here's this garbage that I want to throw at you. And I, I, I'm just, I'm out of there. So I'm not willing to put in the work, I guess, nor do I have faith that putting in the work would make a difference. Um, so what do I do? I subscribe to some newsletters. I subscribe to some news sources. I have their apps. I have some of their feeds in an RSS reader. I'm currently using ReadKit, but I've used NetNewsWire in the past. I've used uh, Reader in the past. I've used I Know Reader in the past. That's all uh, via Feedbin. My newsletters go into Feedbin via their email gateway, so they show up in there too. So I pick I pick some news sources that I want, and I pick some newsletters that I want. And I follow people on social media that I that give me links that I want, and that's how I do it. I, I the idea. So I have spent time cultivating those sources, but the idea that I would spend that time instead hoping to train the capricious algorithms of Apple News to give me what I want when when they open up for the first time, it is so honestly kind of repulsive to me the kind of garbage that they've got in there. I'm sorry, I just I I don't. I only I only use Apple News for a couple of things. One is when I need to write about Apple News, so I force myself to use it so that I know how it works. And two, when I want to read a Wall Street Journal story. And that's about it. <laughs> uh, I don't also don't think that it's a ton of work to just follow the blogs that I'm interested in. Like, and that's what I do. Outside of that, I don't. The majority of news that I want in my life is just stuff about the things that I care about. Um, if the the only world news source that I use, I I like the Economist. I I like their app. They have uh, this kind of morning roundup, and they write like five long sentences about the five world news mm-hmm. stories you need to know about. And that, that's as much as I tend to want in oh, yeah, when it I comes sub- to world news. I mean new. For for newsletters, like I subscribe to a daily baseball newsletter mm-hmm. that is a that has a lot of links to stories in it, plus a lot of fun commentary. I subscribe to a daily uh, newsletter about California news. It's called the California Sun, and it's full of links to news sources in California about news that's relevant to people in California. And I read not only that newsletter but the links that it sends. Um, so I've got some, I've got a few others like platformer and like, there are other mm-hmm. things that I subscribe to like that. Um, the athletic has a baseball newsletter that I subscribe to cause I like baseball and I read that and I, I click to the links there and then I've got a bunch of stuff in RSS and then I've got like the couple of newspapers and a couple other news sources that I subscribe to and that's it. Like, and, 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 and some other there. Yeah, there are other newsletters, too. But like I've just pulled it together like that. I, yeah. I don't. Then I go, you know, then I go on 
on Apple News and I just I see a bunch of news sources that I don't care about or that I know it's just all clickbait garbage rewriting other people's stories. And um, and that's when I tell it what I'm interested in. Or just with opinions that I fundamentally disagree with. There's like a lot of that in Apple News to me too. Yeah, like, well, there's like, oh yeah, here's some fun. Well, y- your choices are you get the general news that's sort of curated, but it's from it's about stuff that I don't care about and and curated from a lot of places that I don't want to see content from. And if I pick like, oh, but you can follow topics, the topics you follow, it's all garbage. Like the topics I follow, at least, they're they're not curated anymore, and it's all just kind of clickbait garbage. Where it's like, oh, my entertainment stuff is coming from like Slash Film and Screen Rant and CBR, and and like it's all just SEO rewritten mm-hmm. links to the Hollywood Reporter and Variety stories where they take one sentence and weave a whole, you know, story of garbage out of it. Um, garbage is not the word I want to use, but I'm going to just stick with garbage. So yeah, I, I just, I can't, I can't even with Apple news. And is it possible that James is right? And that the amount of time I've spent cultivating my news diet, I could have spent trying to train Apple news to give me better stuff. It is possible, but I just don't believe it. I think that it's so fundamentally at odds with what I am trying to get, um, I just, I, I honestly, I wish that Apple would start again. I feel like if Apple made Apple News a place that included like, you you know, you could directly curate a little more of like what your sources were. And there's some of that with some news sources, but not others. And put your newsletters in there and put RSS in there and make it much more personalized. But they don't seem that interested in it. They, they've got their curated top level and then they've got their non-curated stuff that's full of garbage. And that seems to be what it, what it, it just doesn't, I have no faith in the, leaving aside the app itself, which I know, you know, they have made some strides and it's a better app than it was. But like the news sources, it's still just it doesn't speak to me. And maybe maybe I'm not the target audience for it. But I I find the content, you know, literally repulsive. I open it up and I'm like, this is gross. Please just show me that Wall Street Journal story that I'm searching on via its headline so I can read it and get out of here. And that's just it's not great. Not a great thing to be in. As a little bit of follow up. Uh, from James Thompson, who checked, uh, you can't rotate the virtual Mac display as far as he could see in Vision Pro. You you, you can you have a bunch of resolutions, but you can't make it uh, uh, like a the ninety display. degree rotate. Yeah, you can't yeah. do that. It's all horizontal, not vertical. If you would like to send in feedback, follow up questions for the show, go to upgradefeedback.com and fill in our wonderful form. Thank you to everybody that does. Uh, the articles we were referencing earlier that Jason wrote about the sports app are over at sixcolors.com where you can read Jason's work all the time. You can also hear him on shows here on Relay FM. Uh, you may actually enjoy it downstream if uh, you liked our conversation about sports and streaming earlier on. Uh, you can go and hear him there. Um, and the incomparable.com as well. You can hear me on Relay FM and check out my work at cortexbrand.com. We are on social media. You can find Jason. He's at Jason L, J-S-N-E-L-L. I am at iMike, I-M-Y-K-E. We mentioned it earlier, but go and find the video clips of the show on your favorite platform, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. We are at Upgrade Relay. Thank you to our members and supporters of Upgrade Plus. Go to getupgradeplus.com to find out more. Thank you to our sponsors this week, Uni and Squarespace. And we'll be back next time. Until then, say goodbye, Jason. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.